İslemek istiyor. İslemek istiyor. Dinlemek istiyor. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Fuat Kayman, uh, I am the director of Istanbul Policy Center. Uh, welcome to our special uh, webinar uh, on uh, United States uh, and uh, we are having a very special guest, uh, our dear friend, uh, colleague mm -hmm. Charles Kusha. Welcome Charles. Charles, nice to see you. Thank you. And uh, with us there is also Soli Özel from uh, <coughs> Kadir Has University, but of course uh, all of you guys know uh, Soli. And then Selam Aydın Düzgit from Sabancı University and Istanbul Police Center. Uh, we should actually thank Soli Özel. Uh, he, relate uh, a message to us a couple of weeks ago that uh, our friend Charles Kupshan has a new book uh, called Isolationism, a history of America's efforts to shield itself from the world. And uh, we decided to have a special uh, book launch or book seminar uh, on, on Char <coughs> Kupshan's uh, new book. Of course, uh, we know uh, his work very well, at least uh, from my own point of view. Uh, uh, you know, his uh, no once world was very effective uh, in, in Turkey too, in the, in the, in the world, not only the United States. Uh, it is one of the books that I actually use in my, in my work on the globalization and class on globalization and international relations. Of course, uh, for me, his previous book, How Enemies Become Friends, 2010, was very influential. And uh, before, before that, uh, the end of the American era was quite influential. Now we have the fourth one on uh, United States American foreign policy charts, but again, uh, I think it's a kind of a, a sequence. The previous uh, ones that that that your work on uh, American foreign policy, the broader uh, global uh, context, uh, continues. Thank you very much uh, to be with us today. Uh, we will talk about uh, your book, so we will start with you, and I will give you the floor to you. So why don't you actually? Tell us about the book, uh, what it involves, what kind of aim that you had actually in, in writing it. Uh, and then we will actually start the conversation. Please, Charles. Uh, thank you very much uh, for hosting this uh, seminar. And thanks to all of you for, for joining. And, and I look forward to the, to the conversation. Uh, we're obviously, we're speaking uh, with each other at a, uh, a very interesting time. Uh, the, the vote still comes in uh, as we speak. It looks as if uh, Mr. Biden is going to emerge as the victor, but who knows what will happen in the next uh, days and hours. So I'm going to set aside the U.S. election. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it during our conversation, uh, but I'm going to I'm going to start us off by talking a little bit about about the book. Uh, and and as you will see, it does have some implications for for what's going on in the United States today amid the election. Uh, for, big, for starters, you know, I, I think maybe it would be helpful for me to talk a little bit about why I wrote the book. Uh, and for me, I, I think it probably began in the 1990s when I uh, was uh, in the National Security Council under President Clinton and I began to notice that coverage of foreign affairs in the print and broadcast media was going down sharply. I saw President Clinton very reluctant to intervene in the Balkans, despite the fact that there was a lot of bloodshed there. And he had said uh, uh, when he was running for election that he would intervene. And that began uh, uh, to, to impress upon me the possibility that the internationalism, the robust engagement abroad that I grew up with might not last after the end of the Cold War. We then had 9-11, and 9-11 riveted the country. Everybody was again focused on international affairs and particularly on al-Qaeda terrorism, the Middle East. But those, uh, uh, you know, the response to 9-11 did not go well. 
we got the forever wars, and suddenly this exhaustion, if you will, with international affairs began to reappear. And that's when I said, and this was around 2010, 2011, you know, I think I really should look back at the country's history to understand more about where it may be heading. And so I said, I know a lot about American foreign policy from World War II to today. I know almost nothing about American foreign policy before World War II. And so I so just started to read. Uh, and I have to say that, that uh, my, my head exploded. I was, I was shocked by what I was finding in the sense that the United States, really from 1789 when it began life as a federation until Pearl Harbor was very isolationist really wanted to run away from the world rather than run the world. And during the 19th century, there were many debates about extending the country's reach abroad, about going into the Caribbean, <clears throat> the Pacific, Central America. And each time these debates came up, the answer was no. We want to listen to the founders. We want to abide by the admonition, the advice of George Washington. And George Washington in 1796 in his farewell address said, commercial relations with everyone, political connections with no one. And that really was the guiding light for the United States right through the 19th century and up until Pearl Harbor with two detours. 1898, when the United States fought a war with Spain to kick them out of Cuba and then took Cuba and Puerto Rico and Hawaii and the Philippines and a number of other, other areas in the Pacific. But that didn't go so well because Americans said, you know what, we're not imperialists. We don't want overseas colonies. And so you swung back toward isolationism. And then Woodrow Wilson comes along and he enters uh, World War I and Americans didn't like that either. He was more, much more of an idealist than was McKinley, who started the Spanish-American War. And so these two attempts at getting engaged in the world, the realist attempt in 1898, the idealist attempt in 1917, neither of them worked. And that cleared the way for the very stubborn isolationism of the interwar era, the 20s and the 30s. And just to, just to kind of clarify what I mean by isolationism, uh, I mean, whether or not the United States is willing to take on enduring strategic commitments outside North America. The U.S. was engaged abroad commercially from the beginning, engaged abroad diplomatically from the beginning, engaged abroad, abroad politically. It expanded territorially across North America, but it did go no further than the Pacific. And so in the book, I, I essentially say, okay, continental expansion, taking hold of North America, pushing Native Americans out of the way, that to me was foreordained, it was going to happen. And the question that I think is critical is would the US go further? Would it go abroad? Would it extend its reach into other strategic theaters? And on that question, the United States was profoundly isolationist right up until Pearl Harbor. The second introductory comment that I think I'll, I'll offer is, uh, again, a revelation. You know, the first revelation is that the internationalism of the post-World War II era is the exception, not the rule. The second revelation for me was that one of the main motivations for isolation, for geopolitical detachment, was American exceptionalism. And this to me was a great surprise because as someone who grew up uh, during the Cold War, who went to graduate school in the 1980s before the Berlin Wall fell down, who's lived in the United States since then, American exceptionalism is the justification for going out in the world for spreading democracy. Well, before 1941, it was the opposite. The founders said essentially, to back the unique nature of the American experiment, to preserve our liberty and our prosperity, 
we need to avoid entanglement abroad. They feared that getting engaged in foreign wars would impair, not advance, domestic prosperity and security. And in that respect, the exceptionalist narrative, which was with the United States from the very beginning, was a justification for staying aloof from the world, not for engaging in the world. And that really didn't change until Pearl Harbor, when Franklin Roosevelt and those who came after him began to cast a different narrative and to argue that American exceptionalism meant that if the United States could not change the world by standing aloof and being an example, it would change the world by going abroad, by becoming a democratic crusader rather than a democratic model. Let me end with a few thoughts on, on where we are today. We are obviously in the midst in the midst of a hotly contended election. Uh, whatever the outcome, it is clear that the country is deeply divided. I'm not a fan of, of Donald Trump and the brand of America first that he has implemented, but I think it's important to harvest lessons from his presidency. And one of the lessons that I draw is that the United States is hitting yet another inflection point similar to 1941 in which the robust internationalism of the last 80 years may be waning and in which the idea not of an isolationist return is front and center but of an america that focuses much more on its own agenda on the domestic front on the pandemic, on the economy, on health care, on race, on integration, and that we're, we're really moving into a next phase of American foreign policy in which domestic politics and the domestic priorities will take precedence over foreign, foreign affairs. And I believe that what we're living through today is, is something that is not all that different from the 1930s. Americans are tired of overreach. They're exhausted from the wars in the Middle East. We're experiencing an economic downturn of a sort that we haven't seen since the Great Depression. We're witnessing political divides of a sort that we haven't experienced since World War II and the 1930s. Americans again worry that ambition abroad has come at the expense of liberty and prosperity at home. The nativism that often went with isolationism is coming back. And it's important to keep in mind that even though the US has been an immigrant nation, racism and anti-immigrant sentiment was a key factor preventing it from going abroad. The United States in the 19th century didn't expand into the Caribbean or Latin America and the Pacific in part because it didn't want to integrate non-whites into the body politic. In the 1920s and the 1930s, the US blocked immigration from abroad, particularly of non-whites and people who were not Protestant. That's coming back. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm uh, amazed by the degree to which racism and intercommunal tension has come back into American political life. So I don't think that the pendulum is swinging back to the isolationism of the 1930s or the 19th century, but I do think that it's possible that that could happen. And that's why in the book, I argue that what we need to do today is find that middle ground between doing too little, which is where we were in the 1930s, doing too much, which is where we've been over the last couple of decades, and to find a stable foreign policy that enjoys the political support of the American people. Right now, I would say our foreign policy is overextended. Our, our, uh, our political commitments, our strategic commitments are out of sync with our political will. And this is not just Donald Trump. I would point out that the Democratic platform for 2020 calls for getting out of the Middle East, ending the wars in the region, stopping policies of regime change, focusing on the domestic front. 
Bipartisanship is hard to find in the United States, but one area where I think Republicans and Democrats agree is that it is time to retrench. So my, my conclusion in the book is that it is, it is uh, past time for what I would call a judicious retrenchment to put American foreign policy back into line with American means and American purposes. In my mind, this mainly takes the form of a strategic uh, pullback from the periphery, from the Middle East, in part from the region in which Turkey uh, resides, but not from the core, not from Europe, not from Asia. And I would point out, for those of you who don't follow closely what the debate is here in the United States, there is today a very strong voice. It's called the Restraint School that is calling for the United States to get out of Europe, to get out of Asia, to come home. The cover of Foreign Affairs, the policy journal of the establishment a couple of issues ago was come home America, question mark. This is on the left and the right. George Soros, who is a, a liberal, and uh, Charles Koch, who's a libertarian, they formed a new think tank called the Quincy Institute, arguing for the United States to end its over-militarized foreign policy. So the debate here is changing. My view is it's important to get ahead of this and to find that middle ground between doing too much and doing too little, because I fear that if we don't do that, if we don't pull back by design, we will pull back by default. And that to me could clear the way for dangerous overreach to turn into even more dangerous underreach. And I do think that right now, that's the core debate that we have, especially given that we see from this election, a country that is deeply divided. And that even if Joe Biden emerges the victor, we will see a country that continues to be uh, uh, divided deeply between those who, who have an America first view of its foreign policy and those who prefer us to go back to something more resembling the pre-Trump era. Thank you, I will stop there. Thank you, Charles. Uh, if I understood you correctly, uh, you actually suggest that uh, maybe it is time for the United States uh, to think uh, strategically. Uh, focus more on the insight and, and also certain part of the world. Uh, but in doing so, uh, maybe isolationism, but isolationism should not mean nativism. So it shouldn't be, you know, sort of a trap by, by, by nativism, nor restrain, uh, you know, getting out of everywhere. So, so you are proposing uh, this as a kind of a strategic thinking, a new strategic thinking for American foreign policy and, uh, and I think it is it is important to uh, to do this uh, right now because in this election, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, as you said, it's an extremely polarized society, and in America should have actually certain strategic uh, choices. Thank you very much. I think it is very important uh, that that that that you actually uh, you know sort of draw our attention to history. We shouldn't forget that this isolationism actually is, is was that. And before the Second World War, of course, it took a different part in the time after the Second World War, and America was hegemonic then, as you actually very describe very well in your no one's world. When we have a multipolar world, different actors going out, and then we have a different kind of American foreign policy. I think we should, you know, we, we, we had to rethink about American foreign policy and strategic choices. And uh, today, actually, we have COVID nineteen. We have all these processes. And then you are proposing a new strategic uh, thinking. And I think uh, it's a very thought provoking. Uh, and uh, uh, let me actually stop here and maybe turn to uh, Soli Özel. Uh, I think you uh, made an interesting uh, point about uh, uh, the, the Americans' uh, new strategic choice to get out of maybe from Middle East, but uh, you know, stay in touch with or in, in a relation with. Europe and, and in Asia. Of course, uh, we are doing it in Turkey and Middle East you know, has been going through extremely, extremely tragic you know, times. All the tectonic uh, stones have shifted. 
failed states, rise of the you know non-state actors, rise of Russia, rise of China, and uh, Sole, what what can we take from uh, Charles? <laughs> Charles, you know, in terms of what we talk about now uh, in, from Turkey's perspective or being in Turkey, not only in Turkey, but if you are in the Middle East, your focus is on Syria, Iran, Iraq. If you are in the you know sort of MENA region, you are actually, your focus is in Libya, East Mediterranean. If you are in Greece, your focus actually is East Mediterranean, Turkey. There is uh, you know Azerbaijan, Armenia conflict. So we are talking about all these uh, geopolitical you know conflicts going on uh, here. And what can we take from Charles in terms of what is going on? You know, in, in this part of this region, what it means, what he says, what it means, uh, you know, to talk about isolationism in terms of Middle East, uh, North Africa, East Mediterranean, this part of the region, or, or generally from a geopolitical point of view. I'll try to thank you for it. Uh, Charles, welcome. Uh, good to be with you, and thank you for accepting the invitation. The book is truly fascinating, and I read it very critically because I wanted to poke you on it. But uh, on the historical matters, I obviously do not know enough. Uh, but I find your uh, arguments very persuasive, uh, and uh, at least it opens ways of new ways of thinking about American foreign policy. You're right; we have all been socialized uh, to see. American foreign policy in its interna liberal internationalist phase, and our criticisms or our supports have always been within that framework. You identify six interlocking logics of isolationism, and those six points are actually at times in conflict with one another. They don't really support one another, but one or the other always comes on top. And there are questions that I want to raise based on each one of them, perhaps. First of all, uh, you talk several times in the book that the United States used to be an exemplar or saw itself as an exemplar and not as a crusader, but it did become a crusader in the uh, post-1941 period, definitely after 1945. But wasn't it really inherent, intrinsic to the self-identification as an exemplar that you would at some point or another transform into a crusader? At any rate, that was done in the Western Hemisphere. That would be my first question. Second, and based on what you have just said um, on immigration, your number five, you, the point number five about isolationism is protecting social homogeneity. Why was the 1965 Immigration Act passed then? It's, it's an anomalous thing. And in, if you will, the beginning of the problem of what the late Sam Huntington led Sam Huntington to write his late last book, that is, Who Are We? And obviously that question was answered in 65 in a very different way. And I really wonder why and why nobody has actually woken up to that until the late 1990s. Um, it is true if you think that you have a manifest destiny, if you, if you are the city on the hill, what you don't want, and this is how I translated in, if you will, my former professor Ken Jowitz terminology. The, what you're saying in the book is the United States did not want to be contaminated, and con contaminated in particular by Europe, which most of its initial inhabitants or the, the first um, Puritans and the other have actually escaped from. But now it is contaminated. So the question would be, can you really turn the clock back um, what you call the underreach position because of where we are in space and time, because of the fact that American capital is far more entrenched with the rest of the world and globalization, even if it is receding somewhat, is still with us. Um, secondly, you are part of the 
foreign policy elite, uh, you seem to have, based on your previous books as well, you seem to have accepted that the American moment would not last far too long, that we were moving into a very different world. Could you explain to us why uh, what uh, Ben Rhodes so derisively called blob uh, hasn't come to terms with that and why is it still resisting? And it appears it hasn't really learned anything from its own mistakes. The, fight that, the two final questions and then I'll briefly touch upon this Middle East thing. Understandably, your book is written from an American perspective. You try to tell us why the United States behaved this way or that way in different periods of its history. But, the, the, but in this internationalist phase, particularly after the Cold War, but also during the Cold War, the United States had done things. It failed and its failures have been extraordinarily costly in those places where it actually failed. Why should everybody else pay the price for America's mistakes? Why don't you ever pay up the invoices that are your due? Uh, and, and that, I mean, that is not your question, but I don't think it's an unfair question to ask of American decision makers either. My final question is, how on earth did you get to write such a book while working at NSC, teaching at Georgetown later on and having three kids sitting on your kitchen counter? If you give me the formula, I will be forever your slave. <laughs> on the Middle East thing, uh, again, the United States is responsible, at least to a certain extent, for the utterly chaotic conditions in the in the Middle East, the failed states and all that. And part of it, it has to do with the fact that because of its failures, it actually started to retreat and nobody has uh, is capable of filling the void that the US presence leaves. Turkey tries to do that. I think part of the reason why Turkish foreign policy is far more active and abrasive uh, in, in the region has to do with the fact that in Iraq, the U.S. failed. It, has, it cannot make big commitments any longer. The space is open, and in that space, we now see Russia, and Turkey is trying to do certain things. And of course, the ironic uh, outcome of the Iraq war was that uh, a war that I think the architects of which wanted to unseat the Iranian regime have actually made Iran a very formidable force in the region because they presented to Iran with balance to Iraq on a silver plate. Uh, so, and that's what the um, that's what explains, in my view, uh, Turkey's activism and the, the uh, rapprochement between particularly threatened uh, Arab Gulf Arab countries and the, and the state of Israel, which suddenly changed even the, the logic of Turkish-Israeli relations as well. As for uh, Libya, which was never really a state, uh, and uh, it's run by the balance of power between seven tribes, I see it. I don't know if anybody can fix it, but uh, Turkey may have overreached there as well, or at least it has seen the limits of what it had done. I really don't see an American administration really putting too much energy, money, and uh, uh, prestige into solving it. And I guess that would all be relegated to the, to the Europeans. Then the final point is, if the United States, the, you said that there are those, the restraint school saying, get out of Europe, get out of, get out of uh, Asia. That I guess, is, unlikely to happen. But what about the other school, which is the offshore balancing school that you uh, actually allude to at the, end, at the end of your book? Is that not an option? Is Europe really that important uh, for the United States if the main, uh, the main 
rival is China. And I'll conclude with the following. Is the fact that there is now a, an ascending power when the United States is in relative decline, uh, is, could it be possible for the US to actually withdraw from the world because when it did insulate itself, when it did try not to be contaminated, it was the ascending power and the others were powerful perhaps, but eventually they were going to decline. So will the United States take relative decline uh, soberly or aggressively? Thank you, Shuri. Uh, I was going to turn to Senem uh, and uh, some of Shuri's point uh, relate to Europe and the question of Europe, but uh, especially the uh, the uh, first part of Shuri's uh, remarks uh, directly uh, relate to the book. So maybe we go back to you, Charles, if you like, uh, you, you answer to Shuri as far as the points that he makes about the book and, and, and you know your classification in the book about isolationism and maybe you actually you know sh share with us your take on the first part of Sony's uh, excellent remarks and then I will actually turn to Senem uh, and then we come to the Euro part. Very good uh, uh, Fuad. So yeah I will what I'll do is comment on on Soli's uh, excellent expose of, of the what I call the anatomy of isolationism and then maybe we'll, I'll, I'll delay my conversation of the Middle East until Senem has had a chance to, to intervene. Um, I think um, solely that, that you are right that the transition from America as an exemplar to America as a democratic crusader was baked into the equation. That is to say, it was coming. Uh, I think the, <clears throat> the issue at, at, to, to kind of unpack is, you know, how it unfolded and whether Americans like it. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the first phase of, of that transition did not go well. Right, that first phase starts in 1898 when President McKinley says, it is time to take manifest destiny on the, bro uh, uh, on the road. It is time to take it abroad because the American frontier has closed. We can't expand here at home, so we must expand abroad. And so in many respects, precisely the, the transition, the political intellectual transition that you're talking about took place in 1898, but there was a backlash against it because we ended up colonizing Cuba, Puerto Rico, Philippines, a bloody insurgency breaks out. And so Americans say, wait a minute, you told us that we were going abroad as a democratic crusader and we've turned into an empire. So there's this big pullback. Then Wilson says, well, I'm not going to make that mistake. So I'm going to take the country abroad as a democratic crusader and save democracy from autocracy. And we go into World War I. Americans die in the trenches. He says, we're going to join the League of Nations and preserve peace forever. And Americans say, wait, wait a minute. This doesn't, this doesn't work either. And so those initial attempts the realist attempt, the idealist attempt to take America abroad didn't work. And then finally in World War I, excuse me, in World War II, it does work because Roosevelt combines the kind of realist and I idealist justification. What I think is happening now is again, buyer's remorse. In, in some respects, in response to precisely what you identified, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't show that our efforts were particularly successful. Now you have 
Russia and China pushing out. The world is going in a liberal direction, not a liberal direction. And so Americans are beginning to say, well, well, wait a minute, maybe the world isn't going our way. Maybe we should tend our, our own garden. So this is a very important debate that's taken place within the United States between exemplar versus crusader. Uh, and, and I think in many respects that the election that we are in the middle of today is in part about these different versions of American exceptionalism. Um, on, the, on the immigration issue, uh, I think that, that in many respects, today's election, the close call that we're seeing between red and blue is a referendum on this issue. And, you know, you start off with, with an America that is largely Anglo-Saxon white Protestant. The United States doesn't expand outside North America because it doesn't want to integrate non-whites into the polity. Starting in the 1880s, 1890s, you get anti-immigration acts. In 1924, one of the most draconian anti-immigration acts in American history, that decreases immigration of Catholics and Jews from Europe by 90%. And that really, that extends for decades. And so there was this conception of American exceptionalism that attached it to the population, to Anglo-Saxon Protestantism. And now we're in a country, as you rightly point out, Soli, in which after the 1965 changes, the civil rights movement, the liberalization of immigration, whites are poised to become a minority. And that has led to a, a revolt. It has led to a, a, a political debate that is bitter, that is deeply entrenched, and that will continue to play out over the coming years. And I would point out that around 40 to 45 percent of the American electorate is white without a college education. They're Trump's base of support. They're uncomfortable with the what you would call the increasing diversity of the country. Uh, it's, it's irreversible. It's happening. The demographics show that the country is headed to become more Hispanic, more Asian, more African American, but in the process, it is creating a bitter, bitter political debate here that really goes back to, to the early days. Um, final point I'll address, um, <clears throat> you know, is there, is there a going back? No, there is no going back. The U.S. is in the world. The U.S. is uh, in some respects, the leading country of globalization and interdependence. Decoupling from China is not possible. The global economy is simply too integrated. However, this reality is causing growing pains that are, <laughs> that are ripping the country apart, literally. Right. We, we now, you know, if I if I walk five minutes from here where I am just outside Washington, D.C., stores and restaurants will be boarded up. Right. Think about that. Stores and restaurants are boarded up because the United States is carrying out an election. That that is just a, a, a window into how divisive this issue has become. It, it really is a, a, a, a debate about competing conceptions of the United States. I believe that, as I said, integration, diversity, pluralism, multi-ethnicity is, is irreversible. It's too far down the road. But I also think that uh, this issue is going to cause a great deal of political discord as it plays out. And I also think that we need to harvest important lessons from the Trump era. 
And those lessons for me include build a foreign policy that enjoys the support of the American public, get an immigration policy that makes Americans feel that they have control over who's coming and who's going. Trump has been a very destructive president for the United States and for the world, but we still need to draw lessons. Thank you. I agree. And, uh, and also I agree that uh, there is no going back, uh, but, uh, but the, the, the, the situation, the, the, the uh, challenges are unprecedented and, and, and it's very tearing apart everything. So it is very, very difficult job you know, to maintain globalization, interdependence without going back. And in that uh, lies the importance of uh, U.S.-Europe relations. You know, we always believe in the transatlantic context. We always believe in the West and always we think of the West, you know, you know U.S. and, and Europe. And, uh, but the restraint uh, approach actually even pushes this uh, decoupling, eh? and there's not much, you know, interest in Europe, and, you know, the, the, the, there's a the new idea of U.S. as an independent nation-state kind of kind of thing. Now, let's, let's turn to Senan in that context, that, that uh, how, what, what, what would be your take, uh, Senan, on uh, what Kupshan uh, and Charles said, and then, of course, Sony also made a couple of references to the, you know, U.S.-Europe uh, relations and the situation of Europe. Let's hear from your take on, on isolationism. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm going to start my um, comments and questions with Europe and the transatlantic relationship and maybe say a few other things about the book and the Middle East and a few other things that I dotted down as you were also um, speaking, Charles. Now, about the transatlantic relationship, I think the Trump era, what it did is that it intensified this existential anxiety on the part of most Europeans that the future of NATO and the future of European defense uh, was at stake and that nobody knew what was going to happen if and when US completely withdrew its support from it. Now, I think what we are seeing now is that, you know, some kind of a hope in European circles that you know, things could improve with a Biden administration and that America could profess its support again to the transatlantic alliance and to NATO, etc. But I am not sure personally whether I share that optimism in the sense that when we I mean, of course, things would be much better than the Trump era. That's for sure. Uh, in terms of the civility of the relationship as well. But on the other hand, when we look at, for instance, you know, Biden's article in Foreign Affairs, where he seems to mention Europe only twice, you know, among many other regional priorities in Asia, China, etc. So what I'm wondering, and, you know, this could be taken as a, as a question to you, Charles, as well, that whether or not a meaningful re-engagement uh, with Europe, uh, you know, could be feasible or could we expect that? Um, and whether this could perhaps delay, um, if not you know, completely um, you know, cancel out the push for autonomous actions for a, Europe for a European security and defense policy that is autonomous from Europe, that's autonomous from NATO, and that is independent from, from the United States. So that's just one thing that I've been, I've been uh, thinking about. Now, the second issue relates to also something that Solio Zell mentioned, that is the relationship between US and China, but also in relation to the transatlantic uh, relationship. Because what we've been seeing, again, during the Trump administration, is that a very reluctant Europe to toe the line, toe the US line on China. You know, partly because of economic sort of concerns, but also because of Europe's unwillingness, basically, to go ahead with the Trump tone uh, of policy in China. What I'm also curious about is whether we can expect a balancing, you know, uh, against China uh, that involves closer US and European cooperation, um, you know, in terms of, you know, finding some kind of a more moderate middle ground or perhaps Europeans approaching the American position towards China, as we've also, you know, started to receive signals of that recently from uh, European policymakers, from the Commission statements, uh, etc. So that's just 
my, you know, my just uh, views on, and questions on the European front. front. Now, about uh, regarding the Middle East, something much shorter is again picking up uh, on what Soli also just mentioned. I mean, my hunch is that you know it, it, part of the reason that we've been seeing so many uh, such an increase in unilateral actions in Middle East, North Africa, Eastern Mediterranean by countries like Egypt, you know, Turkey and Emirates or whatever is because of the vacuum that has been left by the United States. I mean, in my opinion, of, of course, US is, is there, but not really there in terms of putting its weight. Now, I'm wondering whether that can change to any extent, particularly in the Eastern Mediterranean, whether we, you know, could we expect more perhaps uh, US engagement or US working again together with Europe and putting a bit more pressure on actors like Turkey um, and constrain them? Because it looks as if, you know, these actors have been enabled by the absence of, of US in the region. Now, these are more perhaps, um, sort of regional um, issues and questions that I've had. Um, if just a few other sort of points, if we have time, is that when we look at this sort of pendulum that you also uh, bring out between isolationism and this overt interventionism, now, it looks to me as if there are certain sets of issues which, you know, uh, both Fouad came and Soliozel also touched upon, and you as well in your introduction, that might benefit from American involvement at the global scale. You know, you have, for instance, climate change. You have, you know, health crises like COVID, or you have these sort of very global issues and crises that are almost impossible to solve unless there is meaningful multilateral engagement. Now, so perhaps we could distinguish between American interventionism or involvement in those kind of issues from the more kind of militarized kind of issues that you're kind of bringing up in your book and speech as well, and perhaps sort of refine uh, the, the ground on which isolationism and interventionism could be possible in terms of the different areas. Now, um, another thing that to me seems important is that, I mean, in the United States, obviously, and also in Europe, you do have this increasing questioning of globalization by the American electorate, but also by the European electorates as well, and the support for protectionism. I mean, that seems to be politically um, on the rise at the transatlantic uh, scale. Now, the, the difficulty, in my opinion, is that, I mean, given this political context uh, across, to the, uh, across the continents, how does the future of multilateralism or sort of meaningful sort of future of multilateral institutions especially in the economic sphere is is is possible given these kind of constraints and pushes for protectionism at home because in my opinion this is also a, a hindrance to the meaningful uh, or a more beefed up and substantial transatlantic cooperation because in my opinion the electoral support behind economic cooperation seems to be also in the decline so um, perhaps this might be also be something that is uh, worthy of um, further discussion. And uh, two final points is when you rightly mention the relationship between exceptionalism and isolationism. Now, can we perhaps argue, make the argument that the so-called American exceptionalism has seriously been undermined in the recent years? I mean, of course, there has been a turn for, you know, um, isolationism on the part of Trump. But in terms of exceptionalism, I think the situation, you know, this the trends towards exceptionalism or the argument for exceptionalism, in my opinion, seems to have weakened in the last years. Um, I mean, if you look at even just this recent election, for instance, all this debate about contestation of votes. Um, this discussion about, you know, America losing its democratic institutions, right, or, or, or, or uh, you know, uh, the contestation of free and fair elections. I mean, all of that. I mean, all that debate seems to place United States 
you know, in the discussions in this larger sphere of discussions about global populism or polarization, which are really not exceptional to the US and which, in my opinion, are very much global issues and, and problems. So perhaps this might push us to rethink the relationship between this exception called exceptionalism and isolationism to, um, to some extent. And a very final comment, and I promise this is the final one. There are many others, but I'm not going to bring them up. Um, I mean, as an academic myself, I mean, obviously, I've been pondering about some of these concepts that you bring up. And just, you know, just perhaps to put you in this, how do we, for instance, historically speaking, how can we conceptually distinguish isolationism from, let's say, sheer pragmatism on the part of the policymakers? So could we perhaps find, you know, another term as such from, let's say, IR literature or, or realist theory to define uh, US foreign policy in the past, you know, when it when it's claimed to be isolationist. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop. I will. Yeah, I will stop myself. Okay. <laughs> that. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, uh, we have actually almost 20 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, maybe I actually add one question to uh, Senem's uh, comments, uh, Charles, and then give the floor to you, back to you. Last two days, uh, Chatham House is having its annual uh, Europe's uh, Strategic Choice Conference, uh, which I'm attending. And there, as Senem said, uh, from a European point of view, you know, we have heard two things constantly, frequently, uh, you know, uh, mentioned uh, in a recursive way. One actually is the need for multilateralism. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, one of the criticism of, for instance, Turkish foreign policy recently is the growing unilateral type of action. Uh, and, uh, and, and that actually uh, you know, benefits uh, Russia. And maybe China long term, but but but it is you know it, it's not going to hand in hand with with Europe and, and European Union, NATO, and so on and so forth. And second, actually, is uh, Senem's uh, you know uh, reference to, uh, for instance, the importance of climate change, importance of COVID nineteen, importance of unemployment, economic issues, and as a matter of fact, all you know, especially economy and health, uh, took a very very important uh, thing actually in the central concern in the U.S. elections, too. And then certain people uh, voted Trump uh, because of economy and because of what goes on in those, those, those regions. How are you going to balance, or, or, or uh, when we actually pose the question of multilateralism and uh, you know, uh, the growing importance of uh, material needs uh, from economy, to health and, and climate change. How are you going to think of isolationism uh, in, co in the context of these two uh, trends that are actually uh, concerning, or at least actually Europe pays attention in terms of its strategic choice, multilateralism and, and, and you know, sort of a friendly, green economically more, but, but economically means jobs for, for, for people and everything. Maybe I actually add that to to to, uh, to Senem and and then give the floor back to you, and then there are a couple of questions I will actually ask those questions to you, Charles. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you for thank you, Senem, for your for your excellent uh, excellent points and questions. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, I think I'll I'll start with the the democracy question in the sense that the the aspect of <clears throat> the Trump presidency that I have found most unsettling is the departure from liberal democratic norms and the degree to which over the course of the last four years and over the last 24 hours, uh, you know, the president of the United States has engaged in, in repeated behaviors that depart from what we would call uh, democratic standards. Uh, and uh, uh, for me, it raises the question of, is this a historic turning point? Are we headed into a period in which uh, illiberalism uh, and various kinds of, of nativist populism become the norm? 
Uh, and, you know, to the degree that this election seems to be heading in Biden's direction, I breathe a massive sigh of relief. But it's important to point out that a very sizable portion of the American electorate more than in 2016 has voted for Trump. And so uh, this is all by way of saying we have a problem here. Yes. Uh, and and we need to keep this problem front and center. And we know we have a problem because it's not just in the United States that this issue has emerged. It's it's on the other side of the Atlantic as well. The second point is that I do think that part of the reason that this backlash has been taking place is overreach in, in its many forms. Overreach geopolitically, in which the United States, as Soli pointed out, has engaged in various uh, acts in the Middle East, which have, have really produced much more harm than good. Economic overreach, in which we have, have basically opened up the liberal international order after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War in ways that have made many of our own publics uncomfortable and feel that, that uh, they have been disadvantaged by globalization. Uh, and so the, you know, my, my view is that, that, that, that, that the, as I said, globalization, integration, multilateralism is irreversible. But what we need to do is to find a sustainable brand of it. Because if we keep going on the course we're going, we will see a backlash. We are seeing a backlash. And so I would say pull back, be more modest, be, poor, be more pragmatic in order to sustain this experiment in integration, globalization, interdependence, multilateralism. In terms of, uh, of uh, engagement with Europe, Senem, you know, I think that uh, Biden is a, an Atlanticist. I think that Europeans, for the most part, are holding their breath, waiting to see the outcome of this election. And I believe that uh, if Biden is elected and does become the next president, there will be a flowering of transatlantic relations. There will be a, a kind of sense that that the this anchor uh, of of the of the liberal democratic world will be coming back to life. And for me, that is a, a very welcome development. But I do think it will be different than we're used to. And I do think that Europeans should be prepared to assume more responsibility. And here, I'll pick up on what several of you have said, uh, and that is that I think that we should turn greater Turkish involvement in, in the world into an advantage for US-Turkish relations rather than a liability. I think Turkish involvement in Libya has on balance been <clears throat> positive. In Syria, some aspects of Turkish policy have been good. The United States, is going to be in retrenchment mode. It will want its partners to do more in the world. And so I do think that one of the things that a Biden administration would want to do is work with Turkey to figure out how greater Turkish involvement in its broader region can be, um, can be married to an America that is looking for partners uh, to do more. And I do think that that uh, you know, it will will the will Europeans and others around the world wonder whether the United States has has has kind of returned to normal, or whether this is you know this kind of back and forth, the unreliability is here to stay. I do think that's an issue, uh, but but uh, uh, Biden, in my mind, represents the kind of leader that will restore faith. In, in, many, uh, in many countries that the United States is back as a team player and as a country that stands for and by democratic norms. On the question of um, multilateralism, engagement versus unilateralism, Senem, you, you raised this. 
Uh, I think that you're very, you're very um, uh, right to distinguish between the two. Because in my mind, what is likely to happen moving forward is the U.S. will retrench strategically and push out diplomatically. Uh, and that's because I think that's kind of where the sweet spot is in political terms. For example, if you look at the Democratic Party, the progressive wing, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, they want less defense spending. They want to end the endless wars, but they are internationalists. And so I think what you'll see happen is the U.S. will re-engage diplomatically, will rejoin Paris climate, will rejoin World Health Organization, will try to renegotiate the Iran nuclear deal, even as in strategic terms, it begins to pull back. And in fact, I think that's the right strategy. That is, you compensate for strategic pullback with diplomatic multilateral engagement. So that would be my, my prediction uh, on that front. And obviously, as you pointed out, Senem, on the key issues before us, the pandemic, climate change, nuclear proliferation, many other issues, cybersecurity, these are not issues that can be addressed by America first or America alone. These are only issues that can be addressed through broad international partnership. Uh, finally, on, on China, you know, my best guess is that China is the external threat that will keep the United States internationalist. Were it not for the rise of China and the degree to which Republicans and Democrats agree that China needs to be contained, I would be more concerned, not just about some kind of retrenchment, but a more serious pullback. And as I said, when I see the writings about offshore balancing, when I see this new Quincy Institute, when I see people like John Mearsheimer and Barry Posen and Steve Walt calling for the US to pull out of Europe, to give NATO to the Europeans, to go offshore in Asia, I worry because I think those steps would be a mistake. Uh, and I do think that, that the rise of China will keep the United States very much engaged, particularly in the Asia Pacific region. But I do, I do wonder, and I, this comes back to a point that Soli raised, I do wonder whether the United States at some point might be more inclined to pull away from Asia rather than to stay engaged in Asia. Because as you pointed out solely in the, in the 19th century, the United States went to Asia because it was weaker and it stayed away from Europe because it was stronger. Uh, and so I do think that, that over the next couple of decades are gonna be very interesting in terms of US role in the Asia Pacific. And I also wonder, coming back to Senem's point about, about the repair of, of alliances, will China end up being able to woo South Korea, Japan, and other countries in the region because they've become somewhat uncertain about American reliability? Because they wonder if we're gonna go back and forth from Clinton to Bush to Obama to Trump who knows what comes next when the country is as divided as it is. So at least at first take, the US is going to be quite internationalist and engaged strategically in the Western Pacific. But I do think that beneath the surface, the situation is more fluid than meets the eye. I thank will stop. You, okay, thank you, Charles. Uh, maybe uh, I get two questions from the uh, audience or those who have listen, been listening to us, and then uh, maybe give uh, to floor to Solia and say them like, just a couple of words that if they like to actually uh, say. One question uh, about Balkans uh, and uh, Serbia uh, Kosovo agreement, and as a matter of fact, uh, Andrea uh, refers to your interview to Radio Free Europe or, you know, and the, and the Washington agreement, but then the President Trump claimed the, uh, that, that he ended the bloody war between the two. 
because the leaders were hugging and kissing each other in the Oval Office. And uh, so he actually, uh, so what do you think about, uh, you know, uh, sort of Trump's position or, or what, uh, actually maybe rephrase the question, uh, what, what is your take on Balkans and, and the Serbia and, and Kosovo, uh, you know, uh, like that? The second one uh, the, from uh, Evren Dincher, uh, referring to uh, Colombia historian Adam uh, Tu's book on the U.S. history and periodization. But, but let me actually rephrase it in a more general way. There are also ways of, uh, you know, periodizing uh, U.S. involvement, military, and, and you know, sort of in the sort of in outside involvement uh, by by by, you know, sort of uh, paying more attention, maybe. You, more attention than yours uh, to to financial issues and political economy, and and uh, for instance, uh, from from his point of view, as much as Pearl Harbor, uh, you know, the the, the period between uh, 1969 and 1931, we see actually American, uh, you know, in Monopa, but it's much more uh, it's a response to the financial issues, and I, I think that's actually security versus political economy kind of. Reading, as I understand it, what do you think about uh, about about uh, the alternative uh, periodization, uh, as far as your book is concerned? Well, on the um, the first question on Kosovo, Serbia, you know, I, I'm I'm more than happy to give Trump credit where credit is due, and I think that uh, the breakthroughs on relations between Israel and the UAE and Israel and Bahrain, and to some extent, Israel and Sudan are big deals. Uh, they, they represent significant steps that uh, he deserves credit for. On S Kosovo and Serbia, I'm a little bit less willing to, to stand up and give him a standing ovation because it was largely economic normalization. And my own uh, um, reading of history is that that often doesn't do the trick, that economic normalization is fine, but in the end of the day, it's political normalization that, uh, that is key. I think Biden will, will lean into this issue. Uh, someone who cares passionately about European security he went to the Balkans repeatedly. I went to, to Ukraine six times with the vice president when I was working uh, in the Obama administration. So, you know, you will have, assuming that he gets elected, someone who cares very much about uh, Europe. And, and I would add who cares a lot about Turkey. Uh, you know, the, the U.S.-Turkey relationship has not been in the best of shape. Uh, of late, but but Biden does have a strong personal relationship with President Erdogan, and I think he will he will look to to push the relationship in in the right direction. So yeah, I mean I think that that Trump deserves credit on these fronts. On the other big big diplomatic issues, his outreach to North Korea, his effort to push Iran into uh, into submission there, you know, we, we haven't seen very positive results. So uh, I think in general, his diplomacy has been virtually non-existent. But uh, when it comes to uh, Israel and, and the Balkans, there has been some significant progress. Um, on the twos issue, for what, you know, I, I, there's no question that, that, and this will also come bring me to a question that, that Senem raised about terminology and whether isolationism is the right word. You know, it carries a lot of baggage. It, it sort of, isolationism became a dirty word in 1941 because of Pearl Harbor. And it's true that the United States was never isolated. It was surrounded by European empires when it was born. It was trading with most quarters of the world from the very beginning. And as I said, George Washington said, trade with everybody, political connections with nobody. In other words, he was saying, we don't want to be isolated economically. And it is the case that in the 1920s, after World War I, the U.S. was 
very much using its economic leverage, Wall Street, investment, debt, working on reparations with Germany to exercise influence, both in the European theater and in the Asian theater. It wasn't until after the Great Depression that the United States pulled out, not just geopolitically, but also economically. Uh, and I, I, I think that that's, it's important to, to kind of make that distinction because I believe that the U.S. has to continue to be a leader when it comes to managing the global economy, currency markets, investment, technology, trade, supply lines, but, but, to, but to keep the American public supportive of that level of engagement, it also needs to trim down its geopolitical commitments because otherwise I fear that there will be this public reaction as we've seen under Trump to pull away from the world economically and geopolitically. And that's one of the things that I think we need to avoid. Thank you. Soleil uh, and Senem, uh, maybe uh, you know, your last words. And then I, I'm going to have a, you know, ask one question that uh, in Turkey we really actually like to hear your you know, take on it about the elections. So give, leave me the election question for it to me and uh, let me give you the floor. Charlie, um, you do have a split elite. You no longer have an elite consensus. Your two parties look at the world differently. Is this something that can be patched up? But more importantly, the Republican Party has turned into a party that is very different from its origins. A party that is not very respectful of either liberal principles or democratic practices. And some of its members have gone so far as to say that the United States was not a democracy, but it was there for liberty. And uh, there are enough corporate people in the United States who do not particularly care about the niceties of the liberal democratic system politically, domestically in the States. Do you see this as a threat? Does the United States, does the United States have to stay a democracy? If it is, if, the, if that democracy is attacked and it has been in the past four years and it would have been continuously attacked in the next four years had Trump been elected, maybe he can still win in the, in the courts. Uh, do you feel a danger, as many pundits did right before the election? Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, maybe something that I wanted to ask earlier, but I didn't want to exceed the time. Um, perhaps, you know, not with extreme relevance to the contemporary debate on an election, but still, um, I'm just thinking that you know, I mean, these days it's quite popular to go back to history and to be able to see certain parallels or also it's also a popular, increasingly popular strand in the IR literature uh, to study how, for instance, political leaders are using historical tropes in their contemporary discourse. So we do see a, a rise in history generally in, in the academic and the academic literature. What I'm just wondering is that when we are looking at these historical trends or certain periods in history that might be relevant for today, I mean, there's always, of course, a risk of overestimating, you know, the significance of this for the current political trends. Um, so in that sense, um, how, I mean, I'm just wondering whether the, whether you think that the US would turn to isolationism or the sort of this towards this trend towards turning inwards had it not have isolationist trends in its history right because we see this you know in some places across europe as well in some european countries with populist leaderships that are trying to turn more inwards and obviously i mean of course it's difficult to compare it with a, a country and the scale of, of the united states and its foreign policy but i'm still wondering whether this would have happened even if you know there wasn't that kind of historical record to begin with. Thank you. 
Let me ask the final question, Charles, but that has to do with the elections. Uh, now that uh, Biden is uh, leading uh, Georgia and Pennsylvania, as you said, uh, we might expect uh, Biden's victory, which which I like, and I hope uh, that would be the result. And and I think uh, it would have actually consequences, not for for for uh, for the U.S. Uh, I think uh, it's a very big, big difficult job. In, in, it will be actually in front of him. But, but nevertheless, it, it's going to be a very important consequences for Europe, Turkey, and other it's just overall re possibility of re-democratization kind of thing. But then uh, we have actually last night, uh, you know, CNN watching Trump, that, that uh, you know, uh, he actually claims that uh, voting was okay until the moment that he would start losing and uh, that, that he considered those as illegal votes. And then after that, he actually, that, that, that is a cheat and it's a corrupt, uh, you know, and so it goes up to the Supreme Court. Do you think there is a possibility uh, in this election where we see the uh, Biden's victory, but being uh, like sort of stopped by the court, Supreme Court? I, that would be actually uh, amazing like, uh, rupture in uh, democracy, starting with U.S. Like, uh, what do you think? That I hope it wouldn't happen, but do you think it, it, there is possibility for something like that, that, that some victory can be stopped by the legal? Uh, um, <clears throat> maybe I'll, I'll combine your question for, with, with Soli's because they're, they're related. Um, you know, just just speaking quite openly, uh, I never imagined that I would live through a political moment similar to today, never, right? I never imagined that we would have a president of the United States who goes on television <laughs> Uh, on an election night and says it's all fraud or who says a few months ago I'm not going to leave office if if if this doesn't of this doesn't go my way or who denigrates scientists <laughs> members of the media hispanics says nice things about neo-Nazi marchers in Charlottesville. I mean, it's been four years, but I still have to wake up in the morning and pinch myself to say, is this happening? Is this really happening? Uh, and so it's, it has been by far, you know, the most sobering. I have to say, you know, I've, I've been crying for the last, two days, because I don't recognize yes. what's been happening here. But, you know, it looks like it's going to turn out okay. That having been said, four to five million more people voted for Trump than they did last time. And the country is, is divided. So uh, I, I can't say with confidence that the pendulum is swinging back in a way that is durable. And I, I guess I would have to say the same thing about Europe. Um, has the center held for the most part in the EU? Yes. But the United Kingdom seems to have lost its way. Uh, there are other countries in Europe where they, the kind of democratic institutions and norms have have been um, under siege. Uh, so, you know, this this is this is a very, a very critical moment. And I think those of us who who care about these issues need to link arms and make sure that the values, the norms, the institutions that we care about survive this this moment. And um, specifically to your point, Fuat, I think that the scenario that you're talking about, that is to say courts, contested election, protests in the streets, has become less likely in the last couple of hours. And that's, and that's because if this were a, 
a vote in which the the winner won by one electoral vote, two electoral votes, then I could imagine Trump saying, well, I'm not going to accept this. I want recounts everywhere. I'm taking this to the Supreme Court. If Biden ends up winning Pennsylvania, Georgia, Nevada, and Arizona, it's going to be more like around three fifty twenty or something, right? They're not uh, too. Then, similar. then, then I then Trump doesn't really have a case, uh, and that's why that's why it's important where we end up. That's why it's important that the that the vote in the electoral college be not razor thin but decisive. And it's generally decisive at the popular level. Um, so at least, you know, as we speak right now at, you know, 11.25 a.m. D.C. time, uh, things are, are, are trending in a, in a positive direction. Uh, to your question, Sinem, I, I, you know, I think that, that there is something unique and historically contingent about American isolationism, unilateralism, the kind of nativism that we see today. Uh, and, and, you know, when I, I started this book before Trump was elected and then Trump gets elected and I'm watching his inaugural speech. And he says, literally, from this day forward, it's going to be America first. And I had just been reading, <laughs> right, the history of 1940 when the America First Committee was formed. And I'm like, you know, oh my God, what's going on here? Uh, and I don't think that Trump has read the history of the 1930s. I don't think that Trump knows who William McKinley is or the history of the war of uh, the Spanish American War, but he's a very astute politician. He was tapping into a strain in the American psyche, the American political culture, the American narrative that has very strong roots in American history, particularly in those parts of the country where he's popular. And so I don't think that this is, uh, uh, this is kind of something that we can think about divorced from the, from the nation's past. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for those of you who are not Americans, and I'm, I'm guessing that most of you are not, if I were to advise you what to read to understand this country today, one of the things I would say, please read my book. But more seriously, I would say, go read the Federalist Papers. Read Washington's Farewell Address, 1796. Read the debates in the Senate in 1919 about whether the United States should join the League of Nations. Read the big debates between Franklin Roosevelt and the America First Committee in 1940 and 1941. <clears throat> I think those, those debates will give you as much insight into what is happening in this country today as reading the New York Times, the Washington Post, or anything that is about 2020 and the current election. Thank you, uh, Charles. Uh, I agree with you too, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, uh, last week it was the 29th of October, the, the beginning of the Turkish Republic. Uh, next week, 10th of, uh, you know, November, uh, the morning of the Atatürk. And we also go back and read the 1920s, 1930s debates. They are much far richer than today's uh, populist uh, you know, demagogues and, and the politicians. You know, I agree with you almost everything you said about the recent elections, and I share with your emotions. And we have those kind of emotions in Turkey too. You are not alone, and, and lots of people have the same emotions in Europe. That's why actually it's a very critical election. You know, it's a big job waiting for Biden, but but I think uh, the world is going through a very very tough times. Like we are undergoing extremely you know unprecedented challenges, and unfortunately, uh, you know, the, we are also facing an eclipse of reason, you know, among the uh, politicians. So thank you very much for uh, sharing your uh, 
book and your idea because sometimes it is important to take a break and go back to history, think theoretically. And, and thank you very much, Soli and Senem. I think uh, with, with your comments, we come back to the you know, current today. It's uh, very, very tough days. But I think it's a good news. Uh, you know, it might be a change. And uh, hopefully with Biden, uh, you know, we might actually have a little opening for, for thinking about uh, America and, and the world and Europe and Turkey in a different different way. And uh, and also agree with you that, uh, you know, Biden uh, is a very, very experienced politician, good relations with Turkey. I, I, I, I like to see Biden-Turkey relations, uh, you know, developing. And I prefer that relation to Erdogan-Trump relations, extremely personal, but, but not bringing anything to Turkey <laughs> or, or, or, or, you know, anywhere in, in, in this, in this uh, region. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you to see you Thank in you. Turkey. I hope to bring you to Turkey in this, you know, if, if you go back beyond this uh, Corona, COVID-19 times, it's always a pleasure to listen to you, uh, Charles. And thank you very much. And thank you, Soli. Thank you, Senem. And thank you very much for our friends. Uh, we have a little uh, community. They get together in these webinars, and uh, and uh, I see the, the similar names. Thank you very much for attending. Stay safe, uh, and uh, hope to see you again, Charles, soon uh, in physical. Thank, thank you very you. much, for Fuad, Soli, Senem. It's been thank a pleasure. You. And I, I hope we have a chance to do this uh, in person before too long. Yes. I hope so, too. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good <laughs> Stay safe, guys. Bye. Bye.